Okay, so thank you everyone for being here at the last session of a conference that we don't want to end, but um, I'm happy to introduce the la our final speaker, uh, Professor John Kopjek. Uh, John Kopjek is Professor of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. She's the author of Read My Desire, Lacan Against the Historicists, a book that everyone should read, uh, Imagine There's No Woman, and the forthcoming Cloud Between Paris and Tehran. She was also the editor of the S book series published by Verso, Umbra, a journal of Lacanian theory, and October, a journal of art theory, criticism, and politics. Uh, before moving to Brown, she was the director of the Center for Psychoanalysis and Culture at the University at Buffalo. So, John. Okay, I, of, of course, want to thank the um, organizers of this uh, uh, conference, Rohit and uh, Aaron. Um, uh, I think it's been an amazing event. Um, I, I learned a lot from all the papers. Um, so I thank you for uh, the invitations to the other speakers. I do not thank you, however, for making me speak after Faisal, whose um, paper was simply dazzling. Um, uh, and it's, uh, uh, especially for its facility in moving from this um, um, uh, literally esoteric thought to, uh, to uh, uh, contemporary problems of, of capitalism. It's something that I have um, struggled with much less successfully, and you'll see that um, in this paper. Um, my project for um, a long time now has been um, on the work of Abbas Kiarostami, the Iranian filmmaker, and I want to treat him um, as a contemporary, the, a contemporary filmmaker um, that he is. But I also wanted to deal with the um, very quite definite background in um, Islamic uh, philosophy um, that he's drawing on. It's quite clear that, that, that he's doing this. Um, but. Um, it's been a hard go. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, I wanted to mention um, the, when uh, Faisal says, some, what says the act of lifting the veil make, makes what's underneath it go elsewhere, that um, um, some of you might um, hear the, the, the um, tones of Heidegger um, in that statement. And Henry Corbin, who is, is the, the person I've been relying on most for this background, um, who was the first person to introduce Heidegger into French thought, um, said that Heidegger held the key to Islamic philosophy. He eventually um, found another, I mean, it was important to Corbin for a very long time, but at, at a certain point it was Mullah Sadra that was the dominant influence in his thought. But I, I mention that for a purpose. It'll appear, um, I'm going to be talking about Heidegger um, a lot in the paper. Um, I'll also say that uh, this paper is a kind of synopsis of a much larger paper, um, three times as large, which was also unfinished. So with all those uh, warnings, I will begin. Taste of Cherry, winner of the 1997 Cannes Film, uh, Film Prize, is the bleakest film in Abbas Kiarostami's oeuvre. The devastating eight-year war with Iran, with Iraq had ended in 1988, but Iran's pal palpable battle fatigue is still pervasive in the film. Not only in the dialogue's numerous references to the war, but also in the ubiquitous presence of militia, and the desperate conditions of the day workers. Absent are the lush vistas of, <clears throat> of <clears throat> sorry, I've already, absent are the lush vistas of the director's other films, replaced here by a flinty, peri-urban landscape. <clears throat> Bulldozers dig deep into the earth, emitting harsh sounds and creating perilous crevices, as if intent on ripping out by the roots the lone tree perched on a hill whose signature presence is sadly missing from this film. That there is not a single woman in the film is also disturbing. 
not because it demonstrates um, Kiarostami's indifference to the plight of women, as many feminists have claimed, but because their absence testifies to the aridity of conditions that nourish desire. Sometime before the film begins, Mr. Badi apparently took the decision to commit suicide, for he spends the whole of his screen time trying to accomplish what turns out to be a not so simple task. The focus and fascination of the film lies in the effort it takes to carry out his resolve. With regard to Mr. Badi's controversial decision, Kiarostami had this to say in an interview. The choice of death is the only prerogative left to, to a human being in the face of God and social norms because everything has been imposed on us from birth, our parents, our home, our nationality, our build, the color of our skin, our culture. If this or some such explanation seems warranted, it is because, because Badi displays no real distaste for life and even goes out of his way rather humorously to mention his love of eggs which he has given up out of concern for his cholesterol. The film gives um, no hint, in other words, that there is anything lacking in his life, any particular circumstance from which he is eager to withdraw. But um, how to put together Kiarostami's explanation with Badi's specific situation? I suggest we start with a passage in which Emmanuel Levinas sounds as if he had someone precisely like Badi in mind when he wrote, there exists a weariness which is a weariness of everything and everyone, and above all, a weariness of oneself. What worries then is not a particular form of our life, our surroundings because they are dull and ordinary, our circle of friends because they are vulgar and cruel, weariness concerns existence itself. In weariness, existence is something like the reminder of a commitment to exist and of the impossible refusal of this ultimate obligation. In weariness, we want to escape existence itself and not only one of its landscapes. Taste of Cherry, I want to argue, is legible through the concept of fatigue developed by Levinas in his early work, Existence and Existence. Other than the fact that this concept clarifies the odd, odd and uncertain trajectory of the film, fatigue has the advantage of allowing us to confront simultaneously the contemporary issues at the film's center, issues of war and capitalism and their antipathy to fatigue, and the philosophical background that informs Kiarostami's image-making practice. That the lone tree with its zigzagging roots, um, a representation of what um, Islamic philosophy thought of as the imaginal world, is being ripped from the world before our eyes, is what the film urges us to observe. If Levinas positioned, um, uh, uh, if he shines a light on this conjunction, um, okay, if Levinas um, uh, shines a light on this uh, conjunction, it's because he has, um, he too addresses concern, concerns stemming from our biocapitalist present while rejoining a tradition that began with a thought experiment conducted in the 11th century by Avicenna, the um, initiator of the Iranian turn in Islamic philosophy. Avicenna's experiment which came to be known as a flying man experiment, consisted simply of his casting a human projectile into a void. For all its apparent modesty, this experiment was enormously ambitious, for it was intended to unseat Aristotle's fundamental claim that we have an awareness of ourselves only secondarily through our relation to the world. Avicenna disagreed arguing that a primitive self-awareness was the condition of our relation to the world. He stipulated that his flying man would glide through the void in such a way as to prevent his coming into contact with any external object, including his own body. 
This stipulation was motiva motivated by his rejection of the idea that the body played any role in self-awareness, although it is important to point out that what Avicenna rejected was a particular notion of the body as a freestanding object that could be touched and contemplated. What his experiment isolated was an irreducible opacity, an obstacle to thought, which Avicenna decided to decided, declined to ignore and on which he staked his certainty. It, admitting that this obstacle resisted removal, he offered his experiment as a means of demonstrating the certainty to which he attested. At the end of the 18th century and through the 19th, a number of philosophers reconducted this early experiment only gradually to realize that it was the, it, its stipulation against touch that held the key to the argument, that the encounter was something that fled from touch and retreated from observation is precisely what constitutes our sense of embodiment, our sense of inner extension. Although he does not mention Avicenna, Levinas does offer an interpretation of the, um, the thought experiment to which Avicenna often, um, Avicenna's is often compared, namely Descartes' um, experiment with hyperbolic doubt. Um, Levinas's reading brings the two experiments closer into alignment. Um, and at another point, um, Levinas um, acknowledges as a precursor Maine de, de Baran, who is one of the philosophers who, who contributed to the, the later taking up of this experiment in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Um, to understand the importance of, of Levinas's in intervention, it is useful to say a few words about the pronounced concern with the body's susceptibility to fatigue, which from the waning years of the 19th century onward steadily increased to the point where it became, uh, became an obsession, a problem whose very insurmountability spawned utopian dreams of fatigue's elimination and or the body's obsolescence. Why, su why such a problem? Because both war and capitalism, and who in the last century would think of separating them, began to mount a non-stop push toward endless war and accelerated accumulation that left no room for the downtime human bodies require. A thorough account of this obsession is presented in Anson Robinbach's The Human Motor, Energy, Fatigue, and the Origins of Modernity, Modernity, which centers on the German concept of Kraft, a universal energy or force that became the fetishized focus of um, late 19th century science and formed the backdrop of Freud's theory of libido as well as Marx's theory of Arbeit, Arbeitkraft or labor power. While the universal force of Kraft was used to overthrow the basic pro, uh, premises of vitalism, a, a power inherent in life, the vitalists won out in the end, replacing craft, craft inspired con, um, conception of the human motor with that of a living or, organism. Devoted to the disciplinary Taylorist regime of the late 19th, early 20th century, and the now displaced notion of craft, the vocabulary and specific target of Robinbach's book could use some updating. 24-7, um, Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep, a recent book by Jonathan Crary, seems to answer uh, to this need, for it dwells on a new form of unmitigated capitalism that, devoid of the utopian impulses that once characterized early modern industry and buttressed by a capacity, thanks to the advances of science, to remain unblinkingly awake, this unmitigated form, um, regards fatigue with an unprecedented enmity. The aim of 24-7 is to call attention to the latest phase of what we might think of as capitalism war, cap, capitalism's war on bodies 
and attempts to imagine ways of resisting it. To this end, one, it turns towards dreams and sleep as bulwarks against capitalism, even as it rejects entirely not only Freud's work on dreams, but the whole of psychoanalysis, and two, several times evokes the work of Levinas without giving any real account of the latter's argument. The price Query pays for this double neglect is his failure to get beyond the notion of a need to sleep in order to elaborate what is entailed by the desire for it, a concept he seems to be aiming for without being able to produce. Taking a stand against the reduction of human existence to its bodily needs, Query, Query critiques capitalism's devaluation of dreams and desires. If the problem we confront, however, is not capitalism simple, but as Foucault famously argued, capitalism's only uh, uh, unholy alliance with biology and the other life sciences then the, it is that alliance which assigns life a dual position simultaneous, simultaneously outside history in its biological environment and inside human historicity penetrated by biopower's techniques. It is that alliance which must be undone. This dual position is indicative of a dualistic understanding of life in which the first term life in, in its biological element is simultaneously foundational and susceptible to erasure by the second, life in its historicity. Thus, biocapitalism's field of operations can, and increasingly has, <clears throat> become all of life, except that part that grows fatigued and, and dies. In the absence of a full-fledged argument, which in my opinion would give both Freud and Levinas their due, Crary's defense of dreams and desires often reads a, as a humanist concession reliant on the pathos of human finitude and frailty as the ground of community. This does nothing to disrupt capitalism's dual positioning of life, but traps itself in the bio-capitalist orbit wherein cultural forms and political formations are conceptualized as the means by which human life defends itself um, um, against, against, it, uh, it, against its own deficiencies. Um, in addition, Crary advocates for um, a good privacy against a bad privacy, which he finds um, the bad privacy he finds in Freud's theory of dreams without offer, offering an account of their difference. What's more, the good privacy he champions, which as we will see contains its own hell, is o always only represented as a welcome retreat. 24-7 is to be credited for once again placing the capitalist vendetta against fatigue on the agenda while drawing attention to the counter concept formulated by Levinas, um, who intended it as a means of exposing, in his words, the lies of capitalist idealism. I will return then to the areas of, of Query's neglect, to Freud, who in the interpretation of dreams literally underlined the fact that his conception of dreams bore witness to a wish to sleep a notion far different from that of the body's natural need for sleep, and so curious that Lacan once characterized it as the greatest enigma. And to the argument of Levinas, uh, the argument Levinas makes in, about fatigue in his existence and existence. In 1940, as World War II, and with it concerned over battle fatigue, was erupting, Levinas was captured by the Nazis and placed in a forced labor camp in a, and, and that. By this point, he had already become disaffected with the philosophy of Heidegger, but the rift was aggravated as the official motto of, of national socialism and unofficial motto of capitalism, Arbeit, Arbeit macht frei, 
was being mounted on the gates of various concentration camps. Heidegger's notion that Dasein was consigned in its being, that it um, had to assume as a task what was given, came at this time and under these circumstances to seem all the more unpalatable. It was during his imprisonment in the labor camp that Levinas, Levinas began to compose his thoughts on fatigue, which he would conceive not as a, a phenomenon befalling an already constituted and embodied subject, but rather as what constitutes embodied subjectivity. He defined fatigue as an enigmatic recoil from and return to anonymous existence, or to what he called the ilia, the there is, the term with, um, with, uh, with which he placed Heidegger's general term as gib. I refer to the recoil return of fatigue as enigmatic in order to stress its non-phenomenological character, that is the fact that it does not occur to a subject already there. But I also want to propose that fatigue is that greatest enigma that very thing, in, um, in other words, the desire to sleep, which Lacan's phrase designates. The movement of recoil return does not take flight from existence, but inserts a hesitation, a cesura, a lag within it. To put it in terms made famous by Herman Melville, fatigue is a recoil, a preferring not to, that also returns um, thus acknowledging the irremissible character of our contract with existence. The resistance um, of uh, Bartleby to all uh, attempts to dislodge him from his office, his place, um, his staunch refusal to depart the premises evidences the, um, the fatigue that defines his peculiar act. The lag produced by, uh, produced by recoil return, or in a word, the cleaving, that is the, se that is the separation from and simultaneous clinging to, holds open a distance from anonymous being and thus makes possible the subject's relation to existence. And um, this refers, the way I use relation, we, I can refer back to the discussion that we had um, yesterday, I think it was, um, about, um, and, and I, whenever I say relation, I I'm, I'm, I'm mean the relation as that forms on condition that there is a non-relation. The, the relation happens in, the, in this space of negativity. Um, the subject is not the agent, uh, the agent who forges this relation, but the place open or uh, afforded by it. The subject is a place in existence, Levinas says, purposefully avoiding the word world in order to distance himself from Heidegger's notion of throneness, whereby Dasein is said to be cast or thrown into an already existing world where it does not feel at home and thus projects itself beyond that world toward the there. It is this ecstatic dimension of Heidegger that Levinas, Levinas finds intolerable, believing it to be inadequate to a theory of imminence. Um, he therefore insists against his former mentor that the subject is not situated in a place, but rather is a place. The subject is thus defined as the primordial event of localization, the first place in existence, and in this way precedes the world um, of established places. Place um, is different from a simple abstract point. It uh, implies extension, um, which is not to be confused here with the distance between one concrete location and another. The relation to existence forms the, the territory of an inner extension and thus runs from the subject as I to an otherness it now assumes as its own but does not fuse with and um, cannot appropriate. 
appropriate. Levinas asserts that this relation to the Ilya, this ex extension of the subject, is what is called inwardness. And if you ask where it is so called, where it is so called inwardness, um, it would, the answer would be in that long philosophical tradition that runs from Avicenna through Maine de Baran, where it is claimed that an inner sense or pri primitive self awareness necessarily precedes the subject's relation to the world. And I will be returning again to that point. The three. <laughs> Whenever, like, the three. <laughs> Try it again. <clears throat> the three points of Levinas's argument on which I will focus are um, intertwined in their effort to refu um, refute the lies of capitalism. The first of these attempts to discredit the dual positioning of life in a manner not dissimilar to the one um, Foucault chooses in his own account of that form of capitalism he calls biopower. This argument is part of the attack Levinas launches against Heidegger's distinction between being and beings. While not, of course, contesting the fact that Heidegger's theorization of being departs significantly from classical ontology, Levinas accuses the German philosopher of retaining in his thought the shadow of an ulterior finality. The ontological difference between being and beings appears to Levinas as an artificial and arbitrary verbal repetition that sets what exists to one side and then so as then to imagine an act by which an existent takes over its existence. Through this verbal repetition, bare existence breaks away from living to become living's end and time is reduced to an economic order that measures the success of our struggle for a future conceived in terms of endurance and conservation. Here, Levinas is accusing Heidegger of inheriting fr um, from the development of the, the biological sciences of the 19th century a new type of finalism, which we would be justified in calling biofinalism to replace the Aristotelian finalism of the good, the good life of classical antiquity when one lived in harmony and moderation is replaced by a definition of life as the good, wherein modernity becomes the era in which one seeks to survive, to sur uh, postpone death, to dominate one's rivals as per Lacan's similar argument in the Encore seminar. Because the primordial possibility of giving myself to myself remains in Heidegger, so Levinas claims, in permanent conflict with my being thrown, abandoned by being, Dasein seems always to lag behind its possibilities, unable to acquit itself of its debt by heeding fully the call of being. Everything happens as if being thrown into the always specific ontic world retroactively cast being as a lost object to which it is never fully able to return. It is said that Rudolf Haas, whose decision it was to display the infamous Nazi motto at the entry to Auschwitz, regarded that motto as a mystical declaration that self-sacrifice in the form of endless labor brings a kind of spir a spiritual freedom. Levinas's second argument is a stiff rebuttal of that declaration, i.e. of every labor mystique, which appeals to themes of joy and freedom. The only joy offered by this mystique is the one Lacan in like manner described as fake, the super egoic pleasure of sacrifice and duty fulfilled. Levinas uh, ties this critique to his critique of that biofinalism he detects in the Heideggerian circuit, which leads each moment of our existence to the notion of the task of existing. When one has to eat, drink, and warm oneself in order not to die, when nourishment becomes fuel, 
as in certain kinds of hard labor, the world, he says, becomes unhinged. This statement does not stop at condemning the conditions of, of subs, subsistence to which the poor are reduced, but aims beyond this at the ontological assumptions that permit these conditions to exist. Ultimately, the mystique of freedom, freedom promising labor, relies on, the, on a supposition of a lack or deficit which the subject seeks to overcome by the willing sacrifice of her labor for some greater and far off gain. This, um, this exposes another duality. On the one side, on the one side, constraint and despair arise, and the um, um, despair arising from it, the matter of the body dense with the weight of its frailties. On the other, the effort of freedom and will, able to overcome all that resists it. An obscure idea of matter and its resistance is opposed by an equally obscure no, um, um, notion of action propelled by freedom. Uh, a freedom which is simply present and ready to do whatever it wants. A freedom then that is as free as the wind, as Levinas sarcastically puts it, or as a flowing river, um, as the mother in 10, a, a film by Karasami, who is a little bit too much, uh, the, too much West toxification there in this utterance, much too credulous, credulously asserts. It is this magical notion of freedom, which comes from nowhere and puts nothing at ri risk, that is responsible for counting fatigue as a nullity, a drag on the high-speed economy and the pace of production. Levinas's own conception of fatigue takes off from a, different, a radically different point um, from, from this biopolitical one. It is associated not with lack privation or the spent energy of worn out bodies, but with an excess of anonymous existence that is, uh, that is with the ilia from which the subject is unable to escape and to which she remains um, incontrovertibly bound. Um, Levinas's critique of the modern form of finality, that is of the idea that, that Freud notwithstanding the aim of life is life, which implies, among other things, that we eat in order to live. Levinas's critique affirms an alternative position. We eat to satisfy our hunger. Hunger cannot be understood in this context as a physiological feeling of emptiness that demands to be filled in order to keep the organism going, but evokes rather a kind of voluptuous or desire, and, and desire as Aaron referred to it, and to which I will return, unlinked to simple survival. The deliciousness of cherries, for example, referenced in the title of Kiarostami's film, makes an appeal to this hunger or desire where the cherries are not simply there for the plucking. Rather than advocating a return to a simpler, plainer life or an appreciation of smaller things, taste of cherries should be read as an indictment of the metaphysical calamity that grounds the refusal um, that, that grounds the refusal of biocapitalism to acknowledge the very excess on which Levinas insists, even as it, that is, biocapitalism, Unwitting, unwittingly deploys this excess in extreme forms of violence. One would argue, as Lacan, one could argue, as Lacan does, that this excess is the very thing capitalism tries to get rid of. Um, the excess, um, which the Ilia is, shows up as well in um, Levinas's third argument which maintains that otherness is the condition of time. Rather than the, uh, rather than the future to which the mystique of labor attempts, tempts us into leveraging our sacrifices, existence and existence privileges the present in which effort and fatigue forge a relation to existence. The present of Levinas escapes the Derridian critique of presence 
in as much as it extracts from the subject a ransom, the ransom of its sovereignty. And I will, well, I say I'm going to return to this point, but maybe in the discussion, but I do, it is an important point to return to this question of the ransom. Now, um, now this um, quickly sketched quarrel between Heidegger and Levinas sets the stage for a return to Taste of Cherry, specifically to the assertion uh, that the fact that everything has already been imposed on us from birth makes suicide a prerogative. Kiarasamy's statement cannot fail to call to mind Heidegger's co contention that Dasein is thrown into a world without having chosen to come into it and without having chosen the circumstances that obtained there. Existing as throne, Dasein constantly lags behind its possibilities, which always seem to precede it and burden it with guilt. The, primor the, the primordial deje dejection attendant on this experience of utter passivity can, however, be overcome. Dasein can successfully assume its own destiny by anticipating its own most possibility of death. It is because no one can die in my place that death has this privilege of being of all possibilities, all capacities, uh, uniquely mine. The assumption of this exceptional possibility of the end of possibilities, i.e. of impossibility, does not require us actively to seek our own death, but to anticipate it. By means of an anticip anticipatory resoluteness, we take over the whole of our destiny by assuming the manner of our approach to death. That is to say, throughout our lives, we take care to die in our own way. It is this argument that um, it is in this argument that Heidegger's indebtedness to 19th century biological sciences seems most clear to Levinas, who revolts ag against it on the grounds that, as um, Foucault will later put it, it volatilizes death, distributes it throughout life, instills within it a kind of mortalism. Le Levinas distrusts, however, the whole concept of being towards death, including the concept of nothingness that it is supposed to anticipate. For nothingness is still envisioned by Heidegger as being in the place of the now vacated place of being's ground. It lies outside being and like an ocean beats up against it on all sides. Levinas therefore turns to examine um, Bergson's famous uh, counter argument, which ri ridicules the concept of total negation as impossible and the concept of nothing as illusory. In the end, however, Levinas rejects Ber Bergson's argument as well, since it is premised on the belief that the something that, that remains beyond all negation is for Bergson, a residual entity, namely the force of life. For Levinas, for Levinas on the other hand, the excess that survives negation is not an entity and has no content. It is, on the contrary, what is produced by the negation of all content. From here, we are able to respond to an admonition made by Derrida on behalf of Heidegger and against Levinas. Um, and this is what Derrida says. Nothing is more clear, he says, waving his finger, um, in Heidegger's thought um, than the fact that being is nothing outside the existent and does not exist outside and does not exist outside the existent as a foreign power or as a hostile or neutral impersonal element. Being is not an archaea which would permit Levinas to insert the face of a faceless tyrant under the name of being. This, this, this article, uh, the article by Derrida is largely praises 
loving us, but does have certain harsh accusations as well. This criticism um, simply misses the mark. For Levinas did not dispute the fact that existence is nothing outside the existent. What he disputes is the characterization of this nothing as a simple nullity. The ilia, he insists, lies in the very heart of nothing. It inhabits the heart of negation. Thus, Levinas rejects both Heidegger's void of nothingness and Bergson's vital force to affirm what he describes as the density or atmosphere of nothingness, the teeming or murmuring of nothingness, um, in brief, the ilia in the presence, of, or in the presence of in the presence of an absence. And let us recall, by the way, that Lacan at certain point speaks um, in these terms of the teeming of of the real. I think it's in. Um, it's, a, it, it's an opposition some, to something that Sartre says about the nothing. Now this debate, I claim, helps to make Taste of Cherry more legible. The remarkable premise of the film is that Mr. Badi is, un, uh, is unable to assume the task of his own death and so solicits the assistance of others attempting through long conversations to convince three strangers, a Kurdish soldier, an Afghani seminarian and a ph philosophically minded Turkish taxidermist to take part in his suicide. For us, the criti critical point is the reason he gives for needing someone else's help in ending his life. Um, it, ha it has to be noted that he does not require that his accomplice assist him in carrying out the original deed but that he perform his role afterward by throwing 20 shovels full of dirt on his dead body. It seems clear that body is not troubled by an anxiety of death. Rather, what seems to arouse anxiety is the impossibility of dying. It is undeadness that fills him with horror. It is undeadness, or to use Levinas' own phrase, the indefectibility of existence itself that is the horror that Badi seeks to escape through suicide. But if the um, if anonymous existence is what remains beyond every negation, how can suicide succeed as a strategy of escape? How can Badi be assured that he will well, will well and truly die given that, as I am arguing, it is this very impossibility that drove him to, co to contemplate suicide in the first place. In what way does Kiarostami's suggestion that body faces the bleak fact that everything is imposed on us from birth relate to our argument? It is precisely because there is nothing prior to existence because every transcendent principle or superior being that might have been assumed to guarantee or determine our destiny has been negated uh, because this instance has, um, has withdrawn, been withdrawn, that being is but the being of the, but the being of this existent, as Derrida rightly says, but without acknowledging that far from disputing this point, Levinas exaggerates it, insisting that existence is irremissible and that the existent, existent is riveted to it. While there is thus no faceless face of a tyrant hidden under existence, no ontic entity, no ontic element in ontological clothing, as Derrida's criticism would have it, there is no doubt that tyranny may and does emerge in direct response to the murmuring of the ilia, can appear w later as a content. We are riveted to the very void, empty, sorry, um, we are riveted to the, to the void, the empty of void, the, the, even the void, the, 
empty even, um, yeah. We are, <laughs> we are riveted to the void, even the empty void, whatever power of negation is applied to it. It is worth stressing this point, the horror of it, not only in light of Kiarostami's clear invocation of tyranny, but also in light of the picture of a cloying and naive altruism to which recent reading, readings, including queries, have tended to reduce Levinas's thought. It is not via the frailties, limitations, or helplessness as, um, um, as uh, a helplessness as bi biology would understand it, that um, Levinas approaches the finitude of the subject, but via a kind of helplessness much more in line with the Freudian concept of Hilflosigkeit. While Heidegger privileges the anxiety of death, Levinas focuses, as he and others have pointed out, on birth. It is uh, again necessary to warn against readings of Levinas that see him as offering a gentler, less virile alternative to Heidegger. Levinas focuses on the horror of birth, uh, on the horror birth confronts, in a way not dissimilar to Freud. It is well known that um, Freud characterized the birth of the human being as premature and consistently maintained that this prematurity placed her not only um, at the beginning but throughout her life in a position of radical helplessness or hilflosigkeit. This phenomenon is first introduced in the project where Freud um, tells us that the, um, the initial helplessness of human beings makes them dependent on the extraneous help of an experienced person and that this relation of helplessness and dependency is what establishes helplessness as the primal force of all moral motives. And I stress this because it seems to open up that kind of reading of Levinas that I don't like, and, uh, and, but I th I'm claiming that it, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it opens up a, a different reading. Later, in Inhibition, Symptoms, and, and Anxiety, he correlates helplessness with anxiety. After contemptuously rejecting Adler's conjecture that anxiety is caused by an organic inferiority, he turns to the thesis formulated by Rank in the uh, Trauma of Birth, which states that anxiety is dependent on the child's loss of the mother. The thesis, the thesis um, earns um, the admiration of Freud, who nevertheless rejects Rank's lar um, larger argument on the grounds that it leaves no room for the ideological importance of the sexual drives. Um, this is no mere quibble, as Lacan himself recognizes, arguing in support of Freud's reluctance to embrace Frank's, uh, Rank's um, thesis thus. While man's libido attains its finished state at the time of birth, the prematurity of birth results in a delay of the libido's encounter with an object. That, that is how this special fault, Hilflosikite, is introduced, perpetuated in man, in relation to a dimension of externality or otherness infinitely more fatal for him than, in the, than the external world is for another animal. So he's invoking a kind of ex externality which is not the exter external world. This is clear enough, at least to me. Um, the primordial helplessness of the newborn and indeed the human being throughout her life concerns not her defenseless defenselessness against the outside world, but against that negative excess psychoanalysis thinks as um, um, libido or jouissance. It is not with a deficit so much as a surplus that the newborn is, is burdened, for in the absence of an object, jouissance is lethal. We misconstrue the infant, infant's wild cries of helplessness if we take them as inar inarticulate pleas for the mother's presence. 
What provokes them, rather, is an overwhelming imminence that announces to the child that she will be taken back up into the mother. Let us rephrase this. In the very heart of negation of the loss or separation from the mother emerges the suffocating presence of her absence, which threatens to vampirize the child to swallow her in its uncanny presence. For Levinas, it is only through the recoil return of, of fatigue that a distance will open up. For Freud and Lacan, it is the famous game of Fort Da. In both cases, it is only the possibility of a distance from the mother that the child is able to assume a relation with her and thus begin to feel secure in her presence. For this reason, the concept of anxiety found in Freud and Lacan approaches more closely to the horror evoked by the Ilya than it does uh, to concept, uh, Heidegger's concept of anxiety. In addition, while for Heidegger, anxiety anticipates the individual subject's death, for Levinas, as well as psychoanalysis, one could argue anxiety is correlated with a death or radical absence. That is not the subject's own and has already happened. This is, uh, connects to the event that has already happened um, that we find in uh, Frank Ruda's argument and in, in Alenka's argument. For Heidegger, finite human existence means that the subject must face the inevitability of its own extinction or what, what has been termed the first death. For Levinas and arguably for psychoanalysis, finite human existence has to face a second death, one that is impersonal and inextinguishable. Freud begins to posit such a di uh, difference when he pointedly distinguishes anxiety from mourning. Anxiety responds not to a loss one, uh, one has experienced and can, thus, uh, and, and can thus mourn, but to a loss that precedes us. This non-phenomenological loss produces something we cannot let go, the presence of a ceaseless, interminable absence, which Freud recognizes very early on through his conceptualization of Das Ding. It is argu arguable, though not in the, in the space we have here, that Lacan's con, uh, contention that every drive, or drive as such, is a death drive, means to underscore this second death or aspect of death. But we will, for now, leave it to Deleuze to articulate the difference between these two aspects of death to which our argument has led us. The first signifies the personal disappearance of the person, the annihilation of this difference um, with, um, which, which existed in order to die and the disappearance of which can be objectively represented as though calculated by a kind of entropy. Despite appearances, this comes from without even when it constitutes the most personal possibility. The other death assumes a strange uh, shape uh, assumes a shape which excludes any identity what, uh, whatsoever. There is always a one dies more profound than I die, as though there appeared um, worlds in which the individual was no longer imprisoned within the personal form um, of the I or ego. Anxiety is the psycho in the psychoanalytic sense emerges in the face of the impersonal ceaseless de death in the face of a pure never experienced pa past. But I want to make two additional points regarding this second death, both of which bear on our, on our reading of Taste of Cherry. While Levinas never speaks directly of a second death, he makes, uh, evokes in existence and existence through several uh, references. He makes reference, uh, uh, several references to the tragedies of Shakespeare. In one instance, he quotes Macbeth. The times um, have been when the brains were out, 
the man would die and there an end, but now they rise again and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. The horror, stranger, more horrible than the murder itself, is the return of Banquo's, uh, Banquo's phantom in the very nothingness created by his death. Levinas's point is, again, not that something or someone returns, but rather that bubbles, that's the, I think the, the Shakespearean word for it, pockets of emptiness erupt in the earth, functioning as traces of the deaths we have survived. The citation of Shakespeare is especially interesting given the Protestant pogroms against the past well underway when he wrote. At a time when the dead were being stripped even of their halfway house in purgatory and shoved unceremoniously beyond the point where they could exert any influence over the living. Shakespeare's strategies preserve a place for the undead that haunt us and thereby recall to us our very lack of ground. Protestantism, Protestantism and capitalism have famously been linked, but never as far as I know on this particular point. Their concerted effort to rid the world of the negative surplus of undeadness. The bulldozers that rip up the earth in taste of cherry are intent, as we, um, as we see even more clearly in The Wind Will Carry, carry Us, on carrying out the pogrom against the past, on rooting out the bubbles or the imaginal world that uh, evidence our interminable loss of ground. <clears throat> After distinguishing the uh, death two aspects, Deleuze makes this apt observation. <clears throat> In confronting these aspects, it is apparent that even suicide does not make them coincide with one another or become equivalent. That the second ceaseless death of the Ilya is indifferent to the first, the death of the individual. <clears throat> that suicide is incapable of negating the indeterminate men menace of undeadness is, as I noted earlier, <clears throat> the dilemma Badi has to confront and the truth to which Taste of Cherry bears witness. <clears throat> the question thus becomes, how, if not through suicide, <clears throat> is it possible to resolve the fatalism of everything imposed at birth? The first um, two people from whom Badi solicits help, a military and a religious man, only confirm his fear that everything is determined in advance. Rules and regulations have been set down long ago and must be observed, inclu including the injunction against suicide. They therefore refuse Badi's request. The third man, however, agrees to help after relating a story of his similar contemplation and subsequent re, uh, rejection of suicide. But this man is nowhere to be seen in the pen penultimate sequence where Badi entirely alone with the, um, is entirely alone with the night. Throughout the film, Badi has driven around a, a desolate, desolate landscape. This sequence takes place in a different location, at his home as he awaits the taxi that will take him to his gravesite. Shot from a great distance, the scene is filled almost entirely with a vast and silent night, a darkness of night. Badi, a small speck in the frame, nearly impercept imperceptible, but for the light of his cigarette, regards the impersonal night with a sleepless intensity as he moves restlessly from room to room, making, we imagine, his final preparations. But we cannot be sure of this. The fact that we can barely see him and that the camera, which does not move, 
calls attention to the edge of the frame, leaves open the possibility that it is he who is being, who is being watched by the sleepless, uncaring night, exposed to an, an anonymous gaze. The, the vigilance of insomnia, which keeps our eyes op open, has no subject, Levinas writes, almost as if commenting on Badi's restlessness, um, but uh, restless but diminished presence. Attention, which presupposes the freedom of the eagle um, that directs it, it, navigates a world filled with dangers to be avoided and opportunities to be seized. It turns towards objects in the world. For the majority of the film, Badi has, with rigid determination, occupied that world. Uh, occupied that world. Unlike un attention, however, the vigilance that def uh, defines insomnia turns away from the world, unable any longer to avoid the consequences of a certain torsion that um, that defines human existence. Vigilance remains awake to an, an, an anonymous rustling that li, um, lives on, refusing to disappear from the world of objects that ordinarily hold it in, in abeyance. We would add that insomnia names a, a helpless vigilance, divorced from will and intention, and implies the impossibility of sleep, of any kind of respite from, wakeful, from wakefulness. And yet, Levinas concedes, if I am aware of being an object of anonymous vigilance, I must be so in such a way that I am already detached from the anonymity. That, that is to say, my very awareness necessarily implies that I have taken some minimal distance from that, um, from that vigilance in which my subjectivity is eclipsed. Can we not read in this sequence from Taste of Cherry a reprieve from the horror of everything determined at birth? Does it not signal the possibility of freedom for a body and his compatriots other than the disputable freedom to die? Kiarostami follows the extreme long shot of the night with an arresting close-up. In an overhead shot, Badi is shown so smugly framed that we can say he is the place in which, he, in which diegetically he rests. Were we able to ask Levinas what he thought of the shot, he would have been quite willing to respond in cinematic terms. Writing at the, at the same time, as the Hungarian film theorist um, Balazs, uh, uh, Levinas too, and in existence and uh, existence, the very book, re um, regards the cinematic close-up not simply as a means of showing details of a larger scene, but importantly, of stopping the action by which a particular is bound up with a whole, of letting it of letting it exist apart. While the long shot exposes uh, the threat, while the long shot exposes the threat to body um, posed by an, um, the anonymous empty night, the close-up puts a stop to, limits this indefectible limitlessness. Um, that is to say, the close-up extracts the object from spatial, which is um, by the, from spatial um, temporal coordinates. Um, so um, body is thereby permitted to um, exist apart, to sleep finally, sheltered from the etern uh, eternity of the there is. Um, Um, sleep, finally, um, is not conceived by Levinas, uh, or sleep is, let's say, the sleep, the desire for sleep, as conceived by Levinas, as well as for Freud, is not a matter of escape, but of participation by non-participation, um, which should not be confused with the enactment, 
and here I quote Levina, should not be confused with the enactment of a new life beneath life. Why this warning? What does it defend against? Levinas here wants to distinguish the subject he is introducing from hy hypokamenon, the underlying substance of classical antiquity, which was presupposed as a primary undifferentiated substrate of being to which determinant qualities or forms of being were added. The subject um, that emerges from fatigue, the operation of fatigue, is originally both the uh, is originally both the underlying being it is it is its own base and the qualities or forms it has or it is a verb doubled up by a having that is levinas thinks modes of being not as sub um and uh, not as supplements of a more primitive life but as the taking up of a place within existence. It is his, re it is his reading of uh, Descartes' thought experiment um, that, uh, uh, ex uh, where this um, position is clearly um, on view in, in, in existence and existence. What Descartes finally affirms is not a logical term or, subs or substance not a sub substance underlying thought, but an intimate and indissoluble relation between the ego and its act, the unique relationship of an I with a verb in the first person. The certitude of the cogito bears on the relation wherein the I clasps itself, clasps itself in its own otherness to itself. Now, I... I embarked on this project because I was following up on some, um, you know, uh, um, on an, a, a longer paper I wrote about um, the uh, uh, Avicenna's thought experiment in the body. And I come back to the question of the body through this notion of fatigue, which seemed to bring Kiarasami project into the modern world more easily. Um, but in this paper, I don't, uh, or in, in the part of the paper I was able to read here, the body seems to disappear a bit. So I just want to sketch out to um, you how it, it gets reinserted, or will get reinserted, and how it's implied. Obviously, it's in, implied in the fact that this inner extension is about the, uh, the relationship of the subject to its body. So it's, it's always an embodied subject. Um, um, Okay, uh, so first point I, I, I would have made in a longer one to, go, to bring back the notions of, of both bodies and the question of freedom, which is, is important because the ar whole argument of Levinas is against this um, capitalist notion of freedom. Maine de Buren, whose work um, uh, on, the body, um, uh, on the body is endorsed by Levinas, is critiqued on two points. One that it is too reliant on will, and two, it proceeds, um, uh, 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 Maine de Braun pr proceeds as if the body is something discovered by the subject, where Levinas says the body is an event, um, an event of the, subject, uh, of the subject, or the condition necessary for inwardness. No inwardness without body. It's not in, uh, um, abstract inwardness. Two, um, the, the question of the relation of having a body and having a past must be brought together in the longer, um, um, in the longer argument. Uh, uh, as, and, and, and the fact that this, uh, that this relation concerns, as I say, the I and the having of, of something, a past or a body, um, this is not, it, it cannot be conceived as a fusion in the way um, Levinas Put this is um, in the following way. We are unable to merge with our bodies with the innocence of Narcissus espousing his own image. Um, so the body remains a kind of opacity or um, dark spot in the mind. Three, um, the, the connection of the past with the body um, I would go De, um, uh, through um, a, a statement um, that um, 
Lacan makes in the anxiety sem seminar where he speaks of the body not as a whole, but as, a re as real cor corporeal morsels, portions of ourselves that can never be retrieved, but remain lost objects. So that would be critical to the development of the, the, the fuller argument. Um, um, and then finally, the idea that rather than being as free as the wind, the capitalist notion, freedom is, um, is uh, in, in Levinas is bound to a past, and a past that has already happened, uh, the worst thing has already happened. Um, um, uh, and the, but the subject has never experienced it. Um, in uh, Difference in Repetition, Deleuze makes a few brief remarks on fatigue very pertinent ones, I must say, and follows them with the following remark. A scar is not the sign of a past, um, of a past wound, but of the present fact of having been wounded. The scar contracts all the incidents which separates us from the wound into a living present. Now this is a psychoanalytic insight. Freud, in uh, remembering, repeating, working through, says, we must make it clear that the patient's state of being, of, of being ill cannot cease with the beginning of his analysis and that we must treat his illness not as an event, uh, uh, an event of the past, but as a present day force. Um, and my argument would be that fatigue transforms the um, uh, ilia, the murmuring of the, the, of the pure past into a present day force in the body. And from there, the subject, through its rela uh, unique relation to this unexperienced path, freedom, is, freedom means expressing a desire from that point of excess. Um, yeah, the re so freedom is responsibility and the capacity to articulate um, a desire on the basis of it. So it ends up again with an ethics of not as there was a, a tendency, as was mentioned here in the discussion, to um, privilege drive over desire in terms of the question of ethics, because the ethics seminar came early. But it seems that Lacan goes back and insists on um, ethics being associated with desire when he uh, when he says we must learn to uh, ethics means speaking well of one's desire. So. That's, that's it. Uh, yes, we'll take some questions, please. Okay, yeah. Thank you, John. Um, uh, I I still have some, uh, maybe some questions or comments on the, on the movie itself, I mean, movie, uh, the movie, The Taste of Cherry. Um, yes, it indeed um, links up with the question of fatigue and uh, specific, although it's completely unspecified in the movie, but it, it is a war fatigue, it is a capitalism fatigue. Sorry, you, you hear me? No, okay, I okay, no, okay. No, no. <clears throat> um, I mean, the... Um, the the circumstances of the movie remain somehow unclear, but it's it nevertheless at all points involve, invokes the war fatigue, the whatever capitalism fatigue, the ruin fatigue, as it were, fatigue of ruined lives. And the great thing in the movie is that the guy actually we never learn why he wants to commit suicide. There is no hmm? there's no yeah there's yeah no. there is no explanation whatsoever. Right. as to why this would be and that this then gives this vast campus where um, many things are invoked without being pinned down but which precisely makes the the, the, the grandeur of this movie in some, in some way that makes but, it like but um, uh, uh, it's too close to your mouth how can I speak more closer <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> swallow it I don't know <laughs> It's as close as it can get. <laughs> just the last sentence. Yeah. The last. But, but. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, there is no reason for this man, no reason given in the movie for this man to want to commit suicide, which opens up all this space uh, of, uh, of the discussion which you delineated. 
the question of fatigue and the question of Ilya, the question of the void, whatever. Um, nevertheless, there is this um, double movement. I mean, he, why does he want someone to assist him? He wants someone to first to make sure that he is dead. So there is the anxiety about the impossibility of dying. I mean, he might commit, commit suicide, but still it's impossible to die. But there is also another anxiety for the, the film can be read in this way that the, there is a Polynesis looking for his antiquity. Um, he wants to make sure that he'll be buried. And the act of burial depends on the survival of the Bikata. He should be allotted a space in, in the big other which will survive him, in some symbolic universe, which is never... So, it's both, they're both things. I mean, the impossibility to die, but also the wish to, to allot a particular symbolic space to death, death. It should be acknowledged as a death. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a death. Um, so, the, there is a survival of the, of the big other. And then, um, when the question arises, you didn't touch the last scene, which is the real enigma of the movie, the real enigma. So I, I was wondering how do you read the, the last scene? Because you, you end it with the, this close-up shot with the, whatever, the, the cloudy sky and the... Yeah. <clears throat> well, the and, sudden close and, and then you have the completely incredible ending, which is actually what happened the morning after. Like, did the guy, this taxi driver, did he do what he was supposed to do? What, ha what happened? And then you have this shot, which is actually the shot about shooting the movie. Yeah. Where the guy walks around, prepares for the next shot. Uh, these soldiers rehearse for the whatever, for the appearance in the movie. So you have the last shot, which is completely enigmatic, which wraps you up in the, in the self-reflexive movie universe after this last suicide scene. So I, I was wondering how, how you read this, this last scene. Okay, the last scene is very controversial and, and it's enigmatic even to uh, Kiarasami. Um, he doesn't know w whether to keep that scene. He, put, he, 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 he first made it without it. He added the scene. Um, uh, he was uh, hesitant and it showed, and he, he, he tried it out in various audiences. And I think it was Jonathan Rosenbaum, at least the he, Jonathan Rosenbaum, claimed to me that it was he who was the, uh, you know, sent a wire to, uh, a, a message to uh, Kiarasami saying you really must keep it in. So it, it, Kiarasami was ambivalent about it. Uh, it's important to say that the, it's not, um, it's not a, the, the last shot is not film, it's a, it's a, it's a digital image. So he switched to another um, image. So, What's, what's clear about it, first of all, and what happens in the scene, that every, everyone who was in the film appears, Buddy appears and all the other uh, people appear, but outside, uh, um, slightly outside their roles. And there's a, there's a form of, of, of drama which is very important um, to Kiarasami and to a number of uh, directors called ta Tazia, um, in which the, um, the characters do not um, don't fully inhabit the, the role. Well, they, 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 they act while, we, while having the script in, the, in their hands, even though everyone knows all the story. They repeat it, but they don't, they, they'll try to um, um, it, um, become you know, one with the characters. They're a bit outside of, of the characters throughout. So I see it that way, but this is a, a ritual performance, a kind of repetition. Um, um, and, um, and, 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 it, and so it works with the, what I'm, um, the idea that I'm trying to, uh, I mean, in some ways it's, a, it's an idea available in other ways that there's a kind of return when uh, to some instance, uh, uh, the, we were talking about it in terms of uh, Walter Benjamin um, earlier today. There's a return to something of, um, in, in the past that it allows us a, uh, something to flash up, something new to emerge. It's, it's basically this idea. It's also this idea in, in Lacan Seminar 11, when he actually uses the term, when he talks about the drive, the movement backwards, um, he talks about, he says, with all the 
connotations of, exhaust, of exhaustion which are there. And then he reads, at the end of the, of the, the seminar, he reads this, um, um, the um, burning child dream, which is about an all sleeping world. And I really, part of what's left out here is a reading of that dream through this theory that, match, that makes the Levinas and, and uh, uh, Lacan um, link up. So yes, it is about that further repetition. But the question whether he, died, whether, um, he committed suicide or not, and, I mean, it's always a question, but, but my, my point is that look at what happens. We have a, what, what you see on the screen is the long shot and, uh, and then the close up. That seems to me to be where you have to begin, not simply on the narrative level, Kiarasami hated narrative, on the level of those shots, what's going on. That's what I try to explain. I think so. And there's also the, the, the night is illuminated. But you could, uh, you know that Levinas is one of the only philosophers who talked about smoking? Who? So there's Levinas. So yeah. there's a passage in Levinas when he says that smoke, cigarette is actually kind of a, one of the first and best figures of uh, temporalization. So it's smoking a cigarette is a way of escaping the anonymity of the Ilya in Levinas. I, mean, an, I forget which essay. It's kind of a passing comment. It's very interesting. Because this smoking, you know, introduces as a kind of primordial rhythm. You take a drag, you inhale, exhale, and that very simple rhythm actually breaks up the distinctionless, arrhythmic, impersonal night of being, as it were. So the cigarette actually stands for the way of, of stopping this anxiety of deathlessness. And I wonder, it would be funny no. to connect. I mean, I'm also thinking, of course, of a lengthiest paper, like you could connect somehow these two papers on this topic of smoking, because you could say the problem of quitting smoking from a Levinasian perspective, I mean, it's interesting, when you smoke, you're constantly reminded of something that starts and ends. It's a, it's a perfect figure of finitude, you know, it burns, literally, it turns to ash, and then you repeat that gesture over and over. So the problem of quitting smoking is actually not the problem of coming to an end of something, but the problem of being confronted with endlessness. You can't put because smoking actually stands for a primordial sense that things can begin and end, that there's a rhythm. I mean, this is also, you could say, Levinas's critique of Freud, in the sense that when Freud, you could also say, what is the point of fourth da? I mean, Freud maybe too quickly has a representational model. You know, it, the, the school stands for the mother. I'm reenacting a certain scene. Because, no, I mean, the point of fourth da is I'm suffocating in some kind of. Uh, presence you know, that I can't comprehend or act in, so I just institute a primordial basic rhythm that gives me space to breathe, here, there. Now I'm no longer just stuck in a kind of empty nothingness. Yeah. I, mean, I think you're absolutely correct to link Levinas and Lacan against Heidegger. I mean, I think that's, that's very clear, but I don't know. I think, that, I, I, I can't remember, this passage on smoking would seem to, it, maybe it, it, could it, say something about the movie in regard to that. I'm not sure, but anyway. It, it just seems, yeah, at the, in the two points that I quoted are Levinas at length, or the, and the, they match, to me, they match the movie so close to the uh, idea of weariness, the, the not, be, what, be, but he has no reason to, to commit suicide, and so this passage on weariness seemed to match up. And also the insomnia, which is that, that's, a, to me, definitely the, uh, Penultimate sequence is an a, a insomnia sequence. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, when, when I watched the film a few years ago, one of the things um, I was uh, kind of, uh, it left with me was that there, uh, uh, I felt that there was a certain kind of exhibitionism of death wish, that this you know, this person, he's trying to engage with the other, another person, and he's kind of getting involved in a certain kind of a sadomasochistic, uh, you know, dialogue that he's continuing to kind of, uh, with the idea of suicide, 
and at the same time there is a push to postpone it and postponement of suicide uh, amongst patient in, even uh, you know in, in the clinical literature it's been described that uh, is a kind of uh, a torture of the soul which person perpetuates and prolongs it and sometimes that uh, prolonged catastrophe sometimes gets them out of it as well so in uh, in the context of this film uh, I just wanted to know whether you've looked at it from that point of view or what are your thoughts? Well, I'm trying to say that there's a, there is an, uh, uh, there is a, what, what, what is necessary is the uh, installation of some gap, some, you know, some pause, yes, in order to escape the Ilya. That, that's the argument of, uh, that's the only, you can't flee from it, you're bound to it, so the only thing is to have um, take some minimal distance from it, so that the idea of possibly could uh, important would work there too. But what also works is the fact that he needs to speak to er everyone in in Kiarostami film needs to speak to someone. His, his basic format of his film is someone in a car, and the other one in the in the driver's seat, and someone. Um, um, in the passenger seat, and it's this conversation that takes place between them, not a face-to-face -face conver. You know, it's this side-by-side -side kind of conversation that is important to them. So, if I, when I develop the argument about the um, ransom, the ransom, is what what, what um, Levinas means by this um, a, a, a ransom, he's talking about the the present. He said the present and and. I could do say a lot more about what Derrida thinks of the present and what Levinas thinks of the present and 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 why they're they're different. But um, the um, but the present for um, uh, is important for Levinas, as I say. But he says it is fleeting. The present is always fleeting. It doesn't last. That seems in some ways to be a kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Everyone knows that. That's how you define the present is fleeting. But there's something. But the, what's interesting about him is, it, 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 in his argument, it depends on. He, he talks about a ransom. To whom is the ra the ransom has to be paid to whom or or what? And it it, it is to another. It means that at that uh, the, the moment one isn't alone in the present. One is alone with the alone. One is alone with uh, you know. Uh, an anotherness that one doesn't inhabit the, pres the present by oneself. So I mean, th and this throughout Kiarostami is striking, the the way that one needs, you know, it ha it has a, you know a partner. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Actually, now that uh, I mean, I, I really find some links uh, between what I was trying to think and and your talk and what also uh, Aaron mentioned. And actually, I, I like this idea very much that the helplessness, it's actually helplessness vis-a-vis -vis the surplus enjoyment, not simply helplessness in this kind of uh, directly physical way of being treated. And uh, I see a certain link here between this kind of feeling threatened by the surplus enjoyment and this whole Zeno's fantasy of the devices as precisely the embodiment of extension of our bodies that actually uh, it's kind of um, Gains independence of our bodies and it's threatening us uh, in return. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the whole fantasy of high devices will actually kind of swallow us. I think it's a fantasy precisely about being helpless vis a vis this kind of a surplus enjoyment, uh, gaining uh, whatever the power. And then the, the, the whole fantasy of the only way to really die, I mean, to get rid of this negativity, is for the whole earth to explode. I mean, that you have this kind of second death scenario just put in the future to get you read precisely of this, uh, of this dimension of uh, this little thing that can grow. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, I don't know if you see that there is a possible connection. I mean, uh, to, uh, not to the, like the whole world will explode. It's not like that catastrophic so much as um, things could change. <laughs> But yeah, there is a particular it, 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 pathological it, it, way, I think, in, yeah. the, in this character to in, envision the, yeah. this, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So I suppose on this good note of fatigue, we can... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs>